yat e she e ha lenda teller pe in she ta ka pa hin shlo to he lini ba she chin ha na ga ni da shin na le a chi e da she che o ta o san in shle i introduce myself in navajo i my name is linda teller pete and i am born of the edgewater people that's my mother's clan um and my father's clan is two rivers that flow together and we have to uh introduce ourselves formally like this so that we establish kinship and we um are uh, if there are audience members that are navajos they know how to address us as we introduce ourselves so that's why we have to introduce ourselves that way okay um in our family um currently um my sister barbara uh teller arnalis she's going to wave there uh she is the the um the elder in our family we have a brother that's more elderly but uh barbara is the master weaver in our family and um uh barbara's children uh sierra and michael are, are the other weavers in our family and uh we have a granddaughter named roxanne lee who is also a weaver and then my husband is a tool maker so in our family um all of our family members work with wool they either work with tools or they make tools um so we're a family that is very productive in in everything that we do uh so barbara and i learn how to weave probably around 6 years uh, of age and we learn how to weave from our mother um and uh, our father made us these looms where we would sit facing each other and as kids uh sisters don't always get along and we have a, a lot of weapons with our weaving tools and uh we can you know uh pick one up and stick it through the warps and kind of bother each other and my mother would put a sheet between us so that we couldn't see each other and as barbara and i saw the backstrap weavers and they were using their uh their their big machete, machete. yeah machete <laughs> We are like, oh, we could have killed each other with those things. <laughs> so, thank God our tools are lighter. Um, in our family, we have seven generations of weavers and uh here's a photo of some of our work. Uh most of our work is regional style, so the top photo has the two gray hills. Um we use all natural wool. Uh we don't do any natural dyeing in our region. Um I learned I started learning how to dye more recently and um that that's part of the visit here to to work with uh Perfidio Guterres one of the things that uh, a lot of people are aware of is the controversial issues between Navajo weavers and Zapotec weavers and um we uh, my sister and I uh have always been concerned about uh our designs and one thing we discovered when we came here to Oaxaca and uh being with Porfirio and his family and we also visited another Zapotec family um Mo Moses Moises Martinez Moises. yeah so works in the silk production um with these uh Zapotec families we were welcome in their homes uh we met their families who all worked together we met uh some parents their children and everybody had a job just like Navajo weavers we discovered that they honor tradition we discovered that they keep their language with their weaving which is very sacred to us because Barbara and I grew up speaking Navajo and it really ties into what we do we also recognize that um uh the the Zapotec people that we met really honor the plants and they honor the earth and they they um um uh, uh they treat things with uh um sacred protocols which we do so there's much more similar similar um traditions than there are differences and we came away from their from their homes nourished by the fact that they cooked for us they fed us um they welcomed us and we understand that there's much more space available for all weavers and we hope that we uh Barbara and I and my husband when we go home that we become ambassadors of um uh, uh telling our Navajo people that there's room for everyone that we all view weaving the same 
that uh, we, we uh, keep our languages and that we keep our um, uh, protocols very sacred, that we're all the same. So in our family, Barbara and I are fifth generation and um, we, we um, have our, our first generation uh, probably from 1850, uh, around that era. Uh, we didn't know her. Um, and then her, her daughter, Susie Tom, is our, um, actually her, her daughter is the Netsui Bitsit. And, um, and her, her daughter is uh, Susie Tom. And Susie Tom has, uh, uh, her children are, are mothers and aunts. And everybody wove the Two Gray Hill style in the region of Two Gray Hill, New Mexico. And uh, we lost both of our mother and our aunt, Margaret Yazi, but they, uh, our aunt, Margaret Yazi, raised the, the red brown sheep that was our inside fill color for all of our weavings. We still have one aunt left, Mary Louise, uh, but she's elderly now and she doesn't raise sheep anymore, but she's still weaving. So Barbara and I learned how to weave from our mother, Ruth Teller. And one thing that was very different about our mom was that she was very concerned about um, leaving a legacy. And she always had a camera and she took photos of area weavers uh, weavings and she amassed a lot of photographs from the area weavers and she would take three photos, one for my mother to keep, one for the weaver and one to stay with the weaving as it got sold. So she was very concerned that all the weavers um, had their names attached and their faces attached to their weaving because before then a lot of people didn't care who wove the, uh, these gorgeous rugs. This is our older sister. We lost her in 1996 but from her we really learned the ins and outs of weaving. We learned how to troubleshoot. She was very um, particular about colors uh, color combination, design construction. So from her, we really learned what were master weavers about. So um, uh, uh, one, things that, one thing that she used to say is, you're only as good as your last rug. <laughs> that was to motivate us. Okay. And next is Barbara. Barbara has been a real trail, trailblazer. Do you know how to explain trailblazer? Okay. Uh, she's been a real trailblazer in our family for knocking down a lot of doors um, for her to sell her own pieces and not let it go through a, uh, through a trading post or a, a gallery. Um, this is a large rug that her and my older sister made together, and this big rug made a big splash in 1987. And I think it really set the mark for Navajo weavers to demand their prices and to know where their textiles are at. And even in our own family, uh, it was hard for Barbara to get out of just weaving two gray hills. She started doing other regional styles and she got a lot of criticism for that, but that's how she raised her family. And she put all of her, uh, her children and actually her former husband through college. And uh, I came back to weaving after having um, a, a government job. And um, one of the things that I do is I like to research history, and that's how a lot of, uh, I do a lot of my weavings. Okay. And our sixth generation weavers are Barbara's children. Um, her daughter is Sierra Najoni Teller Ornalis, and she is um, uh, a young weaver that likes to weave her own style. She doesn't like to be told what to weave, she is still a weaver, however, she is now uh, telling stories with film. She is a filmmaker, she lives in Los Angeles, uh, California, in Hollywood, and she's working on a TV show about Native Americans. This is the first Native American show where we actually can see people like us. And uh, her writing staff and all of the actors are Native. Um, Michael is Barbara's last, last uh, child. He is a really good weaver. Um, he was one of the uh, first um, kids that we taught that just took to weaving like, uh, like a duck to water. 
and uh, a lot of his pieces are uh, collected by other artists. And he does a lot of uh, weaving um, with uh, comic book heroes and video games, so he's bringing in new collectors into, into our uh, market. Our last uh, uh, generation is the seventh generation, and that's our granddaughter, Roxanne Lee. She is the granddaughter of our older sister, Rox, uh, Roseanne. And she's now 20 years old and serving in the United States Navy, but she has woven since she was four years old. And then we have a five-year-old grandson who has his own loom and tools already. So we are just one weaving family out of thousands of weaving families on the Navajo Nation. In, um, in our history, we have, um, we've had a lot of um, uh, warfare, we've had um, colonization, and we had the slave trade. And in, in the midst of all of that, Navajo weavers kept weaving. And because of the, uh, the kidnapping of Navajo weavers, the stress was developed. So it was dark so that they could escape in the middle of the night. And then there are usually four lines that are woven either from the top or the bottom or sometimes both. And it was to give the, uh, uh, the weaver um, bravery to, to escape and go home. And the four lines stand for our four sacred mountains. So when um, President Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, uh, was president in the mid-1800s, while he was freeing the, um, the southern slaves, he signed an extermination order to have all uh, native people exterminated. And so the, the Navajo people and a lot of the Apache tribe, they wouldn't sign the treaties with the United States. So the U.S. Army came in and they rounded up the Navajos in 1863 and marched, um, I think there were about four or more marches um, that took 52 days to Fort Sumner, which is, north, um, which is by the New Mexico and Texas border. And uh, a lot of our, um, our family members died on the way. Um, and they were there in prison from 1863 to 1868. And so while the, um, the Navajos were in prison, the army brought in yarn from Germantown, Pennsylvania, and the Navajo weavers kept weaving, but their um, uh, textiles were taken by the army, and that's why a lot of old Navajo textiles are discovered in the east coast of the United States. And uh, after we signed the treaty, we were allowed to go home in 1868. So in our Navajo Nation, we were free to roam for a really long time, but because the government came in, they drew uh, a land allotment to where our people would now live. And they gave uh, another tribe, which, is, which are the Hopi, um, their land right in the middle of ours. And um, one of the things that happened on the, on the Navajo Nation where there are a lot of uh, trading posts that popped up. That's a trading post is a place where you can buy food, you can buy um, farm equipment, uh, you know, and these trading posts, um, they had about 297 of them, and they all exploited Navajo weavers. Very few of them championed Navajo weavers. So the Navajo weavers would go and buy food, but they'd have to pay an interest on it. And that ha started happening a really long time ago, and it was only until 1973 when the government finally said that was illegal for them to be charging the Navajo people 400% interest every month on their bill. And now there's less than 10% of trading posts that are actually making it. And all of these trading posts dealt with Navajo rugs, silver, baskets, pottery, and all other types of artwork. Um, and then uh, in the 1930s is when the Depression came. And um, the Navajo people are a matrilineal society, and so all the animals belong to the women. Uh, children, the home, everything belongs to the women. But the government, the U.S. government, would not deal with the women. They wanted to deal with the men. And um, instead of listening to the women on how they could uh, restore the loss of grasslands and uh, how to cope with the drought, 
they just decided to kill all the animals and they slaughtered billions of livestock, sheep, cattle, horses, um, all kinds of animals. And that set the tone for uh, poverty for a lot of Navajo weavers. And uh, uh, my sister and I are now at an age where uh, we know a lot about the history and it, it's a responsibility for the two of us to teach classes. And we have two types of audience. We have the non-natives and then we have Navajo students. And people ask us all the time, why do you teach non-natives? Because there's so much that has been written about us that has been wrong. So much that, uh, so many books, so many um, uh, uh, teachers that talk about Navajo weaving that's totally wrong. So with us teaching non-natives, they are um, our allies when, um, when they're dealing with information about Navajo weaving. Because it has taken a lot of years for our voices to be heard and for us to include other people in our drive to put Navajo weaving back in its rightful place. That's why we teach the way we do. And uh, uh, one of the things that uh, we uh, did in 2017 was write a book called Spider Woman's Children. This is the first book since 1492 when Columbus um, uh, entered our world that this book was written by Navajo weavers about Navajo weavers. And we always say that for our information on Navajo weaving, that information best comes from us. And thank you. Muchas gracias.